Okay, um, hello, uh, welcome all of you. Uh, today, we are, our discussion is going to be about acid attacks. Well, acid attack survival is now treated as disability, uh, uh, according to uh, Indian law. Uh, but acid attack survival is much more than that. Uh, it's the most painful uh, and burning, it's the most painful burning experience from inside and out. Uh, today, I have with me uh, Dr. Sona Kazemi, postdoctoral fellow at Ohio State University, and she's associated with Mills College, too. Uh, she has done extensive ethnographic uh, work on acid attacks and other debilitating, uh, other forms of debilities uh, in developing societies such as Iran and uh, she's positioned in America so she's nego she negotiates between uh, first world academic expectations and the developing uh, societies. So it, uh, she uses her rich uh, experience to bear upon her work. I call uh, today's uh, uh, discussion title as Burning Wounds, Disfigurements and Disabilities in the Making and Ethnographic Witnessing. So uh, in preparing for a conversation with her, uh, I was, uh, I just, um, you know, extracted a small note from her chapter, book chapter, which I had a privilege to read. Uh, but before uh, reading that for you, let me ask Sona to say hello to all of you. Hi, Sona. Hi, uh, hey, Dr. Kara. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I am very honored and privileged to be in this conversation with you. Uh, and I'm so looking forward uh, to the talk. Great, Sona. So, uh, well, uh, let me read that out for you, as I promised, from a chapter on acid attack survival. This is the uh, case of Masumi, uh, uh, ab about whom we will m hear more from Sona. Let me read it out. She didn't think for a second that this was a corrosive substance. The liquid, as she remembers it now, was a dark, sticky substance like a condensed syrup or sap. She smelled rancidity, which puzzled her even, uh, her even more uh, about what was happening to her. By, by what and why? She noticed that her uh, monto Islamic covering that women are supposed to wear under the Iri regime was fragmentizing and crumbling off her shawl, hijab, within bracket, the headscarf women are forced to wear at all times in public, started shrinking quickly like a burning, scrunching piece of plastic. The old man throwing the acid targeted uh, Masume's face but since she was standing inside the door, some of the acid splashed on the door. Thus, the acid had even penetrated the door and the asphalt. Even the tiles on the front pavement had holes in them. Still, standing in the uh, semi-open door, Masumi tried open tried to open her eyes after she felt the liquid. The sticky liquid was still uh, pouring down her face. The acid was penetrating her skin slowly and yet quickly. Mazume started screaming, I am burned. Well, 
I don't think I read it so well, but I know I am moved by it. So, uh, so, so now, where do we start? What is acid attack? Uh, can I begin that way? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think you read it uh, so beautifully. Um, it's it's funny when you when you live with these things for so long over years as a witness, like you mentioned, and as a researcher or what I call witness researcher with a dash. Um, it it's very interesting when you hear it from someone else reading it out loud to you because it's a very isolating and lonely experience to to be in touch with this level of pain um, and torture because most people don't want to be uh, very upset with uh, these things so they rather step it so I really appreciate I just want to say that that you have decided to get close to this topic um, and for for people who who are will be listening to this conversation I appreciate that Second, uh, I would like to say that um, it's interesting how these things never get repetitive uh, for me. Uh, even now, as you were reading it, I kept imagining Masume uh, as this was happening to her. Um, and as she was telling me about all these things as it was happening, and I was transcribing and translating at the same time. Um, uh, I would like to say that uh, acid attack is not just um, an act of uh, violence that happens in an incident. Um, acid attack is a form of torture um, that um, almost never ends because it is aimed at controlling the victim uh, or I should say the survivor rather forever. And that is the most interesting, um, well, not in a positive way, thing about acid is that it's not something that ends. Usually when we think about incidents, um, we think about something that happens to you and then ends at some point and then you move on. But with this type of violence and the whole philosophy of it, of it um, sorry, is based on um, controlling the person forever. Yes. So, uh, well, uh, from your, uh, I, I always thought uh, uh, until this date, um, acid attack is an Indian evil. But it looks like it's universal. Uh, that's what I understand from, uh, even in the United Kingdom, yeah, thank you for saying that. Unfortunately, yes, that's the that's the presumption, and and that's very wrong. Uh, as soon as you say acid, people immediately think of just South Asia, like Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. That's not true. Acid attack um, happens in many parts of the world, including you know Cambodia and Iran and Afghanistan, and the UK. Um, and some other parts that I can't remember exactly, but I know that happens in many different parts of the world. So, but the problem is the one in the ones in the UK are mostly gang related. Um, can it's can I explain that more, Sona? Uh, uh, what is this gang, and what is gang violence, and why men are uh, the victims of it mostly? Can you explain more? Yeah, of course. So the the acid attacks in the U.S. Um, I mean, sorry, in the U.K. that happen mostly in the context of gang violence um, is usually um, um, based on a quick revenge. Um, for instance, in the United States, there's um, widespread access to weapons. So people, if they want a quick <laughs> revenge, they 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 use a gun. However, in the UK, um, because there is no easy access to guns, um, there is, however, easy access to corrosive substances. Even, um, I mean, I don't want to preach this, but people use the battery, the car battery, even, because there is sulfuric acid in there. Um, I don't want to teach people that, but 
these are things that people use, use bleach or all sorts of even household cleaning materials that can burn the skin. So in the context... Um, yes, the, 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 ma- the problem is not in the substance, but the intention, right? The instant, Exactly. Uh, yeah. even Once you have that in mind, then you know ways and means to get substance that will do your... Uh, um, exactly. Yeah. Even even here in the U.S., that people are so worried about their rights to have weapons. I mean, the 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 argument is people kill people. Guns don't kill people. Well, and, that, and that looks that, devious to other... me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the argument. Um, well, I live in a red state after all. Um, yeah. So uh, so, but the intention behind an acid attack, according to one interview that was done that I talk about in the uh, in my chapter of the book that hopefully um, come out in the next couple of years, is based on um, uh, humiliation, leaving a mark on the face of your target. So they. It is, a, it is a type of humiliation for men because of this supposed notions and cultural construction of masculinity. Ah, this tough okay. guy attitude. Uh, so man is supposed to, you know, uh, uh, soldier on and you, uh, and you dent his soldiering by, you know, uh, imprinting something on his face, on body, saying that you are exactly. not a soldier anymore. That kind of thing, right? Exactly. It's humiliation. You know how like some gang members, for example, um, have different traditions of tattoos. Like for every person they kill, they tattoo a tear on their face or some other thing. So these are um, just an, um, a- aesthetics of violence. I mean, it's showing off the violence, right? But when it's used on, even in gang-related violence, if they want to get back at a gang member, they might go for his girlfriend, that is the most interesting part. And one gang member who had used uh, corrosive substance on, on this another person's girlfriend was asked, why did you do it? And he, I watched the interview myself. He said, because women love their beauty. So this is another uh, part of this problem, which comes to bite uh, women because of, again, the cultural notions of femininity and beauty and how women must perform this um, uh, beautification of their gender and their bodies. Which again, I mean, these are all notions behind these types of violence. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Not that it's justified, but these are the thoughts behind it. But when the acid attacks are done on women uh, outside the gang violence, it's usually um, on the side of a rejected lover, or um, an angry husband who, I mean, you know, for a variety of reasons, for dowry, um, or for example, in Masuma's case, she got divorced and the father-in-law, um, I mean, decided to throw acid on, on her. Um, so it happens for a variety of reasons, but uh, controlling the body forever seems to me as the common trope in all of these stories. Uh, Coming to that uh, in a minute, uh, when it happens to women, uh, it's 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 more about, uh, you know, making them unavailable, um, making them ineligible uh, or making them, uh, you know, uh, destroyed from inside so that they are not, they don't have a second chance whatsoever about uh, a fuller life. Uh, so in that way, uh, you control them, uh, or the, the, the perpetrator of violence uh, controls them from absence, in their absence. Uh, uh, well, mm-hmm. it's very diabolic, but uh, how, where, where does this all come from, uh, I mean, I'm sure patriarchy is the name of that mindset or m- misogyny, but uh, can we understand it a bit more deeply, Sona? How, how, where does it all begin? 
Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, you named it. I mean, uh, for for those uh, for those of uh, us who might not be familiar with the notion of ableism, uh, because I really want to inject the word ableism here as we are talking about patriarchy and misogyny, because they cannot alone do this. I mean, there is an element of ableism here, and I will and I will explain why. Um, for those of us who might not know, um, as the, for example, um, discrimination against a certain race is called racism, or discrimination against women is, is called sexism, discrimination against disabled folks or mad folks uh, or disfigured folks is called ableism. So when someone throws acid on another, on another person, the intention is to disfigure them. However, there is another thought in that person's mind. That person is already relying on the society's ableism to finish the job for him. And what I mean by that is that he already counts on these already existing notions of performance of beauty on on behalf of women. For example, Masume in this case has become blind in both eyes and has become disfigured. So the notion in the father-in-law's head was to make her, like you said, unavailable for other men. And what he's already doing in his mind is he's relying on the society's ableism that will have to perceive a disabled woman undesirable. They will have no choice but to perceive her as undesirable. And, uh, well, of course, I mean it sarcastically, not that they cannot. But, I mean, this is, this is the notion behind it. And um, so if there, we don't have a cultural um, establishment that believes that disabled people are undesirable why would he do such a thing he's definitely counting on the society to to perform their ableism so this woman can be isolated and alone and undesirable from near and far uh, exactly yeah near family circle and distant uh, societies i mean distant not in the physical sense uh, not non intimate societies around uh, but you also add uh, an angle to ableism here so not cathartic ableism um, uh, this yeah. yeah this framework is very powerful to understand acid attack uh, across uh, societies so maybe yeah. uh, you, you can unpack it for us. Yeah, of course. Um, and I can tell you where it all started. I attended a talk many years ago, um, which was about, uh, I mean, which was done by um, uh, a, a very uh, amazing author, uh, Persian, uh, Iranian author. Um, and what she was talking about in that talk really struck me. Um, Farnoosh Moshiri, her name is. Um, her uncle, Freydun Moshiri, is a, is a very well-known Iranian poet, uh, contemporary poet. Of course, Far, uh, Farnoosh Moshiri is F-A-R-N-O-O-S-H. Last name is Moshiri, M-O-S-H-I-R-I, Farnoosh Moshiri. Um, she's a wonderful author, and she was talking about um, um, this book that she has written, which is which is which is a fiction, is a fiction work um, based on um, her memories of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, and it's interesting where she was defining the word catharsis because in Greek tragedy, as as our listeners might know, catharsis is this moment of witnessing something extremely tragic, and then as you are watching it, getting purified inside. That, that, that's what catharsis means in arts and in tragedy, in literature. But 
the way she defined it, she gave us a different definition. And that really struck me. She said, all right. She, she was talking about how tragic the, 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 the treatment of political prisoners uh, had ended up in the aftermath of Iranian revolution. But the way she defined it really struck me. She said, well, when I look at this tragic moment, the catharsis doesn't happen because I see that this person is in so much pain. The catharsis happens because I look at this person and I am so happy that I am not that person. And it's in fact the happiness that is the catharsis, not the tragedy of watching another person's pain. And of course, she, she meant it in a sarcastic way and she knew. Maybe the sense what of relief doing. that one is not that person. One is not. Exactly, which is, yeah. which is dirty, right? It's very <laughs> dirty. And yeah. I'm just going to, you know, say that. It's very dirty. And as soon as I, um, I came across, um, I mean, this was in my head. And then I started talking to my acid attack survivors that I do ethnographic field work with. And a lot of these people mentioned to me that as they walk down the street and um, when people go by, many of those people say, thank God, thank God, thank God. And how, and do, I, how do they say that in your ethnographic, uh, what is the word they use? In yeah, locally? the word is Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Like with a very weird, you know, in... In Farsi, that means thanks to God or, you know, like uh, what it so basically and they say it in a way that that person hears it. This audibility of it is also what is very interesting. So that reminded me of that moment of catharsis that I had um, I had seen and I had witnessed in Farnoosh Moshiri's talk. And then I came to call this that. Um, anti-catharsis moment of ableism. So basically, you come across this person who is disabled and you say out loud, thanks to God. But clearly, you are not at a church. You're not talking to God. You are using that person as a rosary or as we call a tasbih in, in Persian. Um, you reduce that person in order for yourself to feel superior, to feel better, and to feel good about your own lack of disability. So this is basically the essence of what I call this anti-catharsis moment of ableism, which is a social encounter. It's not spiritual at all. Great. Uh well, uh, it, it now, see, we are at a point to say that uh, this attack, survival and witnessing, all involve socially sanctioned aesthetic values. Uh, in, 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 the, in the Western classical sense and also, well, catharsis as a, uh, as a framework is not yet dead because it, it so fundamentally talks about uh, you know, one's predispositions when watching a work of art or experiencing a work of art or something as moving as or something uh, visceral as acid attack. Uh, basically, it says pit, pity and uh, one goes through emotions such as pity and fear uh, and then, um, you know, uh, somewhere mm -hmm. uh, after that experience, some, you come to terms with it. So that is catharsis and uh, all societies uh, like where I come from, Indian, uh, we have uh, ancient rasa system which is talking about different forms of emotions driven, driven by aesthetic evaluations such as mm -hmm. anger, fear, admiration, uh, love, fear, uh, disgust and so on. Uh, the, the, the problem is unless we talk about ableism, we cannot fully understand or fully mm -hmm. comprehend the 
a central core of any sentiment, including anger and fear, because that is driven by one's capacity uh, or some other, some other person's incapacity or some other person's weakness, perceived weakness. So only then these sentiments get driven or, or into our heads and hearts. So you are so right in uh, bringing together ableism and something uh, uh, experiences, something as, as fundamental experiences, cathar catharsis. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's the way I'm trying to look at now as, uh, at least, I mean, thinking aloud uh, when you say yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, well. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, in, in doing cathartic, in bringing this framework, you also get into body-mind without hyphen, uh, the framework mm -hmm. of body-mind. Because uh, at the end of the day, acid attack is about the conquest of the body-mind. Uh, can you say more about body mind, Sona? Yeah. So um, I think from the Descartesian, uh, you know, time and the Enlightenment and the rise of modernity and uh, the rise of uh, subjects with rights, uh, we have been talking a lot about uh, body and mind and the dualism of the two. So what I intend to do, and of course, before me, Margaret, you know, professors like Margaret Price and Sammy Chalk have pioneered the, the use of the word body-mind as one word in order to emphasize um, the inseparability of the two uh, because they are uh, very much, uh, con I mean, you cannot dissect them. Uh, when we talk about body, uh, inevitably we are talking about the mind and when we are talking about the mind inevitably we are talking about the body and uh, uh, for example when we talk about like a violence like an, and like an acid attack um, of course uh, you can see the scars of on on someone's uh, face or eyes or you might even measure them somehow uh, but how do you measure the scars on their psychology, and their psyche, uh, and their, and their soul, uh, so to say. Or for that um, matter, social psyche. Social psyche, exactly. Or what it does to society, because these types of violence, um, they have a ripple effect, um, and they shake the society. They don't stay. They leak. They scare women. They, they, um, they, um, they discipline uh, women to perform as patriarchy and misogyny and ableism want them to. Otherwise, this could be coming. This is the logic. This is this is the rationale to control women's bodies um, and their sexuality, and their um, and th their um, their desires. Um, um, so it is a leash. It's it's keeping women on a tight leash to say. This is coming. It's it's funny. I was listening to an interview um, uh, by uh, a perpetrator who had thrown acid on his wife. And it's funny, as part of the interview, well, of course, we couldn't see him, but we could hear his voice. He was saying that I was so upset uh, with my wife. I, I took a cab and I was on the cab. I was so sad. And the cab driver said, uh, what, are, what is going on with you? And I told him that I'm like, my wife did something that I didn't like. I'm so upset. And then the cab driver said, all right, go do something to her then. Yeah, I mean, like, it's shaking, right? I mean, which is a kind of advice. And, and, and see, here's exactly where my point lies. What I'm trying to say, sorry, I got uh, a little bit no, diverted no, no. from Please. the yeah. body mind, but yeah. I really need to say this. Um, so we think that when we live in a society um, and a crime is committed, like a crime as horrendous as this, we need to remember what Hannah Arendt taught us after the Holocaust. She reminded us that after the Holocaust, after World War II, some crimes were not done against one person 
or two people or a group of people. Some crimes are against humanity. And that's why we have the, the, the definition of crimes against humanity. Some crimes are not against one person. And I totally, I'm not a legal scholar, but I totally categorize acid attack as a crime against humanity because it's not against one person. It is against everyone. It's against humanity, human soul, and everything we stand for, bodily integrity, um, embodiment, um, dignity of the body, um, and everything we know and we have learned since uh, the enlightenment about um, the integrity of the body. But coming back to what I meant to say when we are all in this together, I meant to say the only perpetrator in these scenarios are not the people who throw the acid. In fact, we are all implicated in these scenarios. And I can tell you why. A few months ago, a man um, in, a, in, a, in a village in north of Iran beheaded his daughter with a sickle. And when they asked him why you did this, these are called, quote unquote, honor crimes, right? Oh because my God, there's so much, so much in India, uh, we have cop panchayats. Yeah, please go ahead. Exactly, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. So, um, so this guy said, well, uh, first of all, he had called a lawyer before doing it. So these, some people think that these are acts of like sudden anger. That is such a mistake. These are very well planned procedures. Um, so he called the lawyer first. Inter interesting he said, you called them procedures. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. the agent removes himself from that act, uh, calling it a duty. Uh, exactly. That, yeah, that's why you use the word procedure. Okay, carry on. So, I think uh, so. Sorry, sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, please. No, carry. no, no. Thank you. Otherwise, I can just go forever. Well, that's a that's a being a, a professor, right? I mean, we can we can talk forever. So it's good to have each other. But um, so uh, what happened is this this guy called a lawyer and asked a lawyer. So if I kill my daughter, what happens to me? And this guy, the lawyer said, well, you don't go to prison because that's your daughter, but you have to pay blood money or what we call dia under Sharia law. And the guy says, all right, no problem. And then goes and beheads the 15 year old daughter with a sickle. And when they ask him why you did it, he said, because the next day I wanted to raise my head in the community. So what I'm trying to say here is that that community that expects that man to behead his wife in order to, quote unquote, preserve his honor is as guilty as that man. So it looks like uh, uh, community uh, and the honor, uh, this honor killing, wherever it happens, India, Iran, uh, other parts of the world, mm -hmm. uh, social uh, gathering or a community has its body mind and uh, for it to be uh, integral for it to maintain uh, for its own sanctity uh, they need uh, you know uh, a sacrifice they need to do a, a duty bound procedure to eliminate somebody who is supposed to tarnish, who is uh, sort of tarnishing that body mind, body mind's integrity. So, uh, so killing becomes exactly. e killing becomes easy in a sense. Uh, you remove your agency as a father, and then just perform your holy duty. Exactly, and what you're saying reminds me of like uh, like ancient times when they would like sacrifice <laughs> like a person in front of the gods or something. Yeah, yeah, like that body mind. Yeah, preserving that um, construct ideological constructs that become so important um, that they because these they, they don't exist in the outside world. Like when I touch my hair right now. This is my hair or this is my finger that I'm touching right now. But 
honor is an ideology. It doesn't exist in the outside world. It's just a concept that we but have But it's made. very visceral at the same time. It's not, exactly. it's not a, just an abstract idea. It is a very visceral notion. So visceral that my blood can boil when somebody close to me is uh, seen as tarnishing that body mind. Exactly. And that's, that's what I meant to say. I mean, that ideology becomes so important uh, because that ideology preserved the supremacy of men in the society. Um, and if that ideology is destroyed by any means, then the men's supremacy in the society is questioned. And that's why they are the most afraid of losing. It's not the honor. It is their supremacy, in fact. That's right. Uh, well, uh, we have been talking about Masume from beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe uh, walk us through uh, the case and also you, your anxieties and your, your uh, journey. Uh, uh, I would... I, I would still call it witnessing. Um, uh, the title of this talk uh, discussion is ethnographic witnessing. Uh, how, how do you walk us through? How can you walk <laughs> us through? I'm asking, how can you walk us through? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Not many people ask about what I feel or what I do in relation to my subjects. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a neat question. Um, in my book, I, I call it vulnerable dash active witnessing. Um, so what happens is uh, I, because I come from um, a community that has gone through two revolutions in less than 100 years, the constitutional revolution and um, another conventional revolution, um, so that shows that we are a very politicized nation, uh, very, very politicized. Um, so in my own life as an activist, I, I have inherited so many um, political activisms and political movements as in the next generation to the revolution and to the war and everything that has happened in the post-revolutionary Iran. So um, that is my one of the many hats that I wear, which is uh, which is important, and I will come back to, to this why. That has taught me one thing that goes way against Western notions of psychology and psychotherapy. Because I am a therapist myself, and I say this, people shouldn't hear this. The 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 governing bodies of psychologists here in the U.S. But here's what I say. I say we should not treat other people's pains as an archive, as a dead information that is sitting somewhere. We need to internalize them. And I mean, and I am using the word internalizing on purpose. I know the Western notions of psychology are totally against this word, but I'm using it on purpose. I believe in internalizing it and living it and making it. And I believe you cannot make a revolution. You can be the revolution. And I believe that in, in my activism as a witness, when I am in touch with another people's pain and I don't run away and I stay present at this exchange and I don't take advantage of um, these marginalized, very disenfranchised people. I instead try to uh, be an ally um, and echo whatever they say um, and be present um, at in their lives in any way that I can. If, it, if it's fundraising, political awareness raising, just be there. Don't rub them of their knowledge and leave. And I say that for young researchers who might be listening to this. Don't steal people's pain. You owe them. 
you need to sit down with a community when when they open up to you i don't know how much that answered your question but well I, uh no cerebral instrumentality please is what you are saying to all of us <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, so uh, take us back to Masumi uh, uh, that way, sure. Sona. Sure. So Masumi, uh, Masumi is a, a very strong woman. Um, we are friends. Um, this happened to Masumi 10 years ago. And since then, Masumi has gone through uh, something around 40 reconstructive surgeries. Um, Masume um, has a 10-year-old son. Uh, she lives with her son, uh, and um, uh, hopefully after the pandemic is over, um, she might be able to get a surgery done on her one eye that still has some sight, um, and we are currently fundraising for that. But what Masume was doing before the pandemic hit is really uh, interesting and admirable. First of all, she found a job at the White Cane Center, which is a nonprofit organization in, in Tehran. Um, she went there and she learned how to use accessible phones, like basically the voice over. Um, and she taught that to other um, people with visual impairments or other blind people. So she, and she became so good at it that she became a very good teacher for other ones who had just acquired disability or they were new. Besides that, um, she learned uh, pottery and became a very good teacher in pottery. In fact, she became so good that she started teaching pottery. And she was making a small income out of that because before this incident, she had a little beauty salon. But after the incident, she had to close it down. Uh, but then she didn't stop. She, she, she did like learn pottery and all this. And now she's doing modeling for um, this women-based, uh, you know, this amazing woman who uh, who make these really nice clothes and she's doing modeling for that. Um, and yeah, and she, she comes on Instagram. We have lives once in a while on Instagram. We talk about the problems she's facing, the, the lack of support from the state. Um, and um, basically, um, and she lives her life um, based on, I mean, counting on feminist solidarity from across the world. There are, and another notion that I thought I wanted to touch upon if we have time is um, transnational solidarity movements that happen. In fact, um, I was not, going to ask about TDM, your, your framework. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. One component of that hmm. uh, transnational disability model. Well, Basically, what I mean by that, first of all, is um, a, a disability movement that is not stuck between nation states. Um, that's that's my first uh, argument. People usually think that when I say transnational, it means global south. But um, that's not what I mean. What I mean mostly is a movement and a consciousness that's not stuck between borders um, or the states. I want a consciousness that's global, but goes beyond those man-made lines or walls. Um, uh, so uh, in, in this model, uh, in relation to this particular chapter, I developed a new angle and I called it transnational analytic of care. And one part of it, of course, I was inspired by your incredible work came in uh, infrastructures of care that really touched me. In fact, I, I called part of the chapter that transnational infrastructures of care in relation to this particular population because, um, for example, I know a bakery in Toronto who is run by an immigrant woman um, who only hires um, mad refugee and immigrant women. And by mad, I mean people who deal with psychological um, concerns like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress. Um, so they raise, well, they basically they send half of whatever they make, they send to these women and these asset survivors so they could make a living. 
with integrity and with, with dignity because the state doesn't support them at all. Uh, at the same time, they raise awareness, uh, they talk to their customers, they, they, they have little boards, they write things on, little quotes, little violence against women awareness quotes. Um, they do whatever in their power, although they live thousands of miles apart. But they, they have raised this political consciousness in themselves to be in solidarity with those women. Um, and this is what I call uh, infrastructures of care, transnational infrastructures of care. Huh. When, uh, um, just going back to Masumi again, uh, and TDM. Uh, sure. Uh, see, she will need one, the recognition, a clinical recognition that her body is in pain and uh, is in crumbling. So she will need uh, uh, rehabilitation, immediate clinical attention, and also restoration of uh, a, a, chan a second chance possibilities for, mm -hmm. for life, anything in life. So in that, mod in that way, medical uh, attention and me proper medical attention is so important. At the same time, uh, a social recognition that acid attack is a social crime. It, it, and it also needs ter tremendous social support around her. And, and the third idea that uh, acid attack is a political, cultural, and historical uh, problem. So, uh, in other sense, medical social models all are required, but they also need to be transcended and uh, looked wholesomely. In some sense, uh, TDM uh, can be a rich framework to understand acid attack and acid attack survival. Is that, is that a fair way of summarizing that, Sona? Well, like I've told you before, you usually reward it so well that I doubt that if it was my statement or not, but it's just you say it so beautifully. Yes, yes, that's that's totally what I mean. And um, I think uh, the social model and the existing models in disability studies are not political enough um, and they're not context specific. Um, they're too general, too Western. Um, that doesn't grasp the reality of complex hierarchies and asymmetrical relations of power uh, across boundaries of race, class, sexuality, and gender. Um, and one reason I developed this model um, was to grasp exactly this tension. Well, I think... We are fairly done, um, but is there anything else you want to add uh, uh, that would uh, add to disability studies understanding of acid attacks and acid attack survival? So now, before we conclude, uh, I would say um, solidarity is really important. Um, just as a final note. Um, I just want to say that um, it's not all gloom and doom. I know we, we sounded like, you know, this is a very, very sad, of course, topic to talk about. But I want you to know that Masume told me, besides all the unkind, um, those anti-catharsis, ableist attitudes that she saw, of course, she saw those. However, she also saw kindness. She also saw um, solidarity, generosity, um, and alliance. So I just want to say that um, crime, acid attack is, is, a, is a torture, is a crime against humanity, um, is, is definitely a crime against, crime against women, and we must stand still against this this violence we we cannot remain silent because silence is a political response 
and we don't want to be judged in the future um, based on this. We need to stand up and say something in the face of violence. Certainly, certainly. Uh, you know, um, thousands of Masumis out there, uh, when they were attacked, when they are attacked, uh, maybe shock, fear, trembling, then massive amount of time spent on bereavement of the lost self, and then maybe a transition into uh, looking to repair themselves, and then eventually seeing the beauty of, uh, you know, their mission. Uh, and uh, well, uh, the 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 trajectory may not be the same for everyone, but uh, mm -hmm. the, but but the way they uh, get get themselves back uh, is what uh, your ethnographic work has uh, recounted. So in that way, it it is a rich framework. Uh, and uh, this is what we need to learn from uh, such a witnessing. Uh, so, so, so wonderful to talk to you, Sona, and uh, I'm sure my audience equally enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, um, I thank you on behalf of all of us. Uh, all all women who have been in this uh, together. It's very important to pay attention to to these um, issues, and we can just start from ourselves. We don't. If we cannot donate money to their surgeries, that's fine. Just don't stare at people. Start from yourself. Don't think that it's not rocket science. It's respect. It's bodily integrity. It's just loving each other, respecting each other, caring for each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.